Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that we are doing a series on the Sabbath School lessons for the second quarter. That would be April, May, and June of 2014. And this series of lessons is known as Christ and His Law. This particular lesson, number eight in that series, is for May 24 of 2014. And it is entitled, The Law of God and the Law of Christ. Somehow in the back of my memory, I feel like that's a, an idea taken from Paul, but we'll have to see. I hope you have your Bible handy because we'll be looking at a lot of Bible verses. But before we start, would you please bow your heads with us as we ask the Lord to bless us in our study together. Our kind and loving Father, in this series of lessons we have discussed many aspects of law and many aspects of the gospel. Help us to understand now particularly how the gospel may affect what we are told is the law of Christ, whatever that is, and the law of God which we are familiar with. May we study them and understand them better as a result of this time together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This particular lesson is going to focus on the idea, the question really, of whether the law of God, and that would be the Ten Commandments as expressed in uh, Exodus 20 and with a little bit of variation in Deuteronomy 5, are still applicable, applicable to Christians today. And um, how, if so, how is it to be applied? We are all aware that no matter where we live, there are various kinds of laws that we must obey. There's national laws, and if you live in the United States, there's state laws, and then there's county laws, and then there's city laws, and if you live out in the countries, there's maybe some other kind of laws and so forth, and there's laws that affect how you use things, and there are laws of utilities, and there's, I mean, there's a whole plethora of laws. But we recognize that there are certain priorities, or certain hierarchy in these laws. In general, National laws take priority over state laws, although there's definitely some states recently are trying to challenge that idea. Um, and then state laws take priority over county laws and down the line like that. So is there such a hierarchy among laws in the Word of God or not? <laughs> Nobody's quite sure. Evidently well, not. <laughs> let's, let, let's, let's take some examples. In the case of Jesus, when he was here, he gave us a new commandment. If you remember John 15, 34 and 35. Would that new commandment be on an equality with the Ten Commandments? That new... Oh, co oh sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, that new com commandment is like the nexus that connects all the other ten so it's, I don't see it really as a new commandment because it fits okay. well with the other one it's sort of a restatement or mm -hmm. I see of the other ten okay There's so how is it different yeah than the old commandment and why did he say I'm giving you a new one if it's yeah. the same old well what if what if the law is just a way of showing you something it's not really made to to tell you what to do, but it's, it's there to show you something. You're asking a then basic... You might, yeah. Then you might um, come up with something else that tells you a better thing in shorter words. I mean... Okay. Didn't you say it was a, a beginning of a change in focus? Okay, a beginning of a change in focus. Um, we have suggested earlier in this series that there are two main completely different types of laws. There are some laws which are descriptive, like the law of gravity, and there are some laws which are proscriptive. That would be one of the common things we think of in this country are speed limits, where someone arbitrarily sets a speed limit, decides this is semi-safe. Uh, no speed limit is, is completely safe, but some speeds are safer than other speeds. And so they say, OK, we're going to set this speed limit, and you're supposed to drive on this road at this speed. So uh, what about? the different commandments that we read about in the Bible. Are some of them proscriptive, or are they all descriptive, or are they all proscriptive? Could the Ten Commandments be descriptive and the laws about how the uh, priests were to handle things in the sanctuary, could they be proscriptive? 
Well, that would seem fairly obvious, wouldn't it? I mean, it seems. It seems. I thought it was profound myself. Yeah, good. <laughs> I think you hit it though. The priest, well, the it was in my brain. Both. <laughs> the procedures with the priest, they're more procedural. Uh -huh. well, those would be proscriptive. Yeah. More yeah, or less. It, 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 it means it, God gave the guidance. He said, yeah. do it this way. So that would be more or less a In fact, you go clear back to Leviticus. It says, if you're going to offer sacrifices, follow this procedure. Yeah. He didn't say, I want your sacrifices. But if you're going to do them, because there were all kinds of other sacrificial systems around the, the landscape. And he says, well, if you're going to do it, then follow this procedure. Can you really divide the law that way, though? I well, mean, because you can take proscriptive and, and put it on this side, you can put it on this side, and, and it all works one way or the other. And, well, um, would you say that, w would you say that uh, the commandment not to kill is sort of arbitrary? Well, are any of them arbitrary? Well, that's the question. If they're not arbitrary, if they completely make sense and there's a strong reason for it, then it, it's more like a descriptive law. You're describing how things really work. If, if, if someone says, this is an arbitrary rule, we are saying you could drive 55 miles an hour on the freeway, there's nothing, there's no sort of absolute <laughs> reason why you can't drive 60 or maybe 50. So that's a more or less arbitrary rule. It's not immoral to, to no. violate the 55 mile speed limit or whatever it might be. Yeah, but there's a point where it's safe. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. But that's still, a, it's yeah. still, but still pulls, you know, pulls you, apart. You, you, got the, you got the point there where everybody has thought that this is a safe point, yeah, and so they make that. So, so then you can go the other way on that, too. So what you're they saying is that even, even proscriptive laws might have some reasons behind them. Unless they're really stupid, like you said. <laughs> yeah. Are the proscriptive laws s to uh, support the descriptive laws, like proscriptive speed limit, speed limit of 55 miles per hour would be a uh, treat your fellow neighbor as you would like to be treated, and it's a proscriptive on how to get to the descriptive law. There's a possibility. Now, the Pharisees in Jesus' day claimed, and I haven't, I, I, don't, I would never have time, I'm sure, to go and, and figure this all out, but they claimed that in the Old Testament there were a total of 613 scriptural laws. And you can look, think back what you know about the Old Testament. You know there are times when God says, do this and do that and so forth like this. So we could understand how they could come up with 613 scriptural laws. You think that might have something to do with what Jesus meant when he said, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets? Now, we, we always talk about come to abolish the law, and we say, no, he's not, he didn't come to abolish the law. He tried to establish the law and so forth. We always talk about the law. But what about or the prophets? Well, Isn't he describing the books of Moses as the law? Okay. And the prophets, the remainder of the, of the Old Testament? But if, if the prophets are just, let's say, historical records, I mean, why would you come to destroy historical records? That didn't seem to make sense. Does, did he mean what the prophets said? Well, that, that, that was the question. And of course, the Pharisees would say, he, he said, do this and do that and do this and do that. And that's how he got the 613 scriptural laws. So they took the laws not only from the Old Testament, but also from the prophets? Yeah, well, they went through all of the Old Testament and said, every, they tried to pick out everything where God says, do this, and that became a rule. Aren't some of those laws, some are negative and some are po uh, positive, some say do and some say do not? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And 365, they say coincide with the days of the solar year, and yeah, I was doing research. <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. There's, there are all kinds of reasons. Numerology was very, very oh. potent in the Old Testament, and all sorts of reasons why this number of something had to be that way and so forth. Yeah. Mm. Well, look at a couple of passages here. Uh, Matthew 19, 16 through 21. Let me see if I can take us there without messing things up here on my fancy program. Mm -hmm. I didn't need an extra window. I was trying to do with one window less here. How many versions of the Bible do you have on that fancy program? Oh man, I don't even know. Hundreds? Lots of them. Okay, 
Matthew 19, 16 to 20. Let's try it once more. Once a man came to Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what good thing must I do to receive eternal life? Why do you ask me concerning what is good, answered Jesus. There's only one who is good. Keep the commandments if you want to enter life. Now, that would be probably cookie-cutter kind of an answer for Pharisees, right? What commandments, he asked. He's, he's trying to get down to the details here. Jesus answered, do not commit murder, that would be a commandment. Do not commit adultery, that's another one. Do not steal, do not accuse anyone falsely. Respect your father and your mother and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, now the last one's a little different, but there are five specific commandments right there just quoted, right? Pretty obviously. Well, um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were constantly, I'm sorry, let me finish that story. Um, I have obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else do I need to do? So what was the young man asking for? Why did he think he needed to do anything else if Jesus told him just what he needed to do? Why didn't he, why didn't he say, oh, well, good. What, what made him think it was something else to do? Because this is an argument that the Pharisees were <clears throat> at all the time. Everyone was trying to say, well, I do a little bit more than you do, and a little bit more than you do, and if there's one more thing I can do, and then I can claim a higher position than you, then I'm ahead of you in the race for heaven. And they were doing that all the time. You know, the biggest question I come up with on that verse there is, why did Jesus only give you five? He knew the ten, but he only gave five. But I think Christ knew what he was sitting on as far as worldly goods, too. He, 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 knew, he knew that, that those are the five that they argued about all the time. Well, yeah, but he, he is, I mean, providentially speaking, uh, this got written down. So there's only five there. Now we yeah, argue well, all over the place because Jesus said there's only five. Well, actually, there's six because when he told him mm -hmm. to go sell everything, he was, he, was, he was having him do the first commandment. Mm -hmm. But the other two, the Sabbath and the not worship idols, still, still aren't told in there at all. Or he didn't, he didn't mention the bearing, uh, uh, um, misusing God's name. Or having any other gods. It was assumed. That was already an assumption. These were the, the, the place where well, the rubber hit the road. Well, you're assuming too. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I mean, we're all we assuming, I guess. So I guess. Look, look, at, look at another place. On the last day that Jesus was in the temple in his life, these, he, had, he had defeated several groups that had come and tried to trap him. Finally, when the Pharisees heard, I'm reading from Matthew 22, starting with verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, remember he, they'd come with this problem that they thought was insolvable about the woman who'd been married to seven brothers. And one of them, a teacher of law, tried to trap him with a question. And they're always trying to trap him. Teacher asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, what do you think they were hoping he would answer? Anything. Yeah. Whatever he answered, they would say he was wrong. They, twisted, yeah. they would say, no, no, it's not that one. It should be this one. So don't. Obviously, Rabbi, you don't know the law, right? Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. Boy, they were just blown away, you know. The second most important commandment was like it. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. The whole law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. And what was the response? Not here in Matthew, but elsewhere. The guy says, good answer. I mean, what, 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 else? what, what else could you say? He's, Jesus summed everything up in his two sentences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, on one... On one occasion, they, asked, must, they sent a young man to ask, what must I do to be saved? When Jesus quoted five of the Ten Commandments, we've just done that, the young man responded by asking, which is the greatest? We've looked at that. And of course, the question I would like to pose to you is, where did Jesus get those ideas? Love, your, love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. And Laws that he gave to Moses yeah, exactly. hundreds of years before. 1,500 years almost before he had given those laws to Moses. So, you know, it, it, I, 
And he had to learn them again, didn't he? Yeah, he had to learn so them So those again. laws are written down in the Old Testament? Yep. Leviticus 19, 18, you must love your neighbors, you love yourself. And Deuteronomy 6, 5, love God foremost. And right there in the Old Testament. I'm sure, you know, I, I, I try to put myself into these Old Testament stories, I mean, these biblical stories. I'm sure there were many, many times when Jesus was tempted just to laugh out loud with their questions. Yeah. He knew what they were trying to do. It all was so silly. And he must have... You know, he, he had an incredible amount of grace to, 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 to quietly answer and show them how crazy they were. Well, Jesus, of course, we believe, was the one who gave the Ten Commandments, right? Mm -hmm. So if there was anyone who was qualified to make a change in the Ten Commandments, it should have been he, right? I mean, if there was any, any, if any, need, any change needed to be done, how could he make change in, in what is really reality? No, I, I'm not. <laughs> I, I, no, I, the I, I, obvious I, fact is he didn't. Right. But I mean, it, that, what yeah. that means is that if he didn't, what right do any of us have to do it? Well, in the Bible, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, mm -hmm. which was the Lord's Supper. And he never said, change the Sabbath in remembrance of me, because I'm going to rise on Sunday. So I don't understand how people can ignore Jesus' own word, yeah. do this in remembrance of me, and it, he meant the Lord's Supper. Are you criticizing people? Well, I'm saying Jesus told us how to remember him. Yeah, he did. And he told us what he wanted us to do in memory of his death and his resurrection. <coughs> there it is. That's, that's what that's for. And we want to a lot of people want to change it to something different. To me, I think it's marvelous when you think about it. He must have been exposed at his mother's knee or somebody's knee very early on. We know he was, I mean, he was smart. There's no question about it, but he came from a poor background. Where did he yeah. get it? Where did yeah. he see the scrolls? Maybe yeah. it was his stepfather had access to it. We'll never know until we get to heaven, but he sure had it down. Yeah. A carpenter who has to support, what, eight, no, eight or nine children? At least. He, he's, he's not got a lot of time to spend in scrolls, but I don't he, think. But he might have known some. I, I don't know. Sure, I, just, sure. I thought about it quite often. At the, what, even allowing for the fact that angels, he prayed all night later. But as a child, he had to start. And by 12, he had the Pharisees yeah. on the run there. Well, that's interesting because um, we know a little bit, just a little bit about what he knew at age 12. He, he understood the Bible and the implications of what they were doing better than they did. Yeah. And I, whenever we talk about this story, I, I always have to, to, to mention a story, which I've mentioned in this class a few times in the past, but it's so, so good I just have to repeat it. There was a black American pastor in the South that was telling the story about Jesus at age 12, and he pictures the, all the scholars there sitting, asking, Jesus is asking them questions, and they turn around, they ask him questions, and finally one of them says, Son, how old are you? And he hesitated for a moment, and he says, Well, on my mother's side, I'm 12, but on my father's side, I'm older than time. <laughs> I, uh, I just love that story. Well, he, didn't he have an uncle that was a priest? I mean, wasn't John the Baptist a cousin? And yes. wasn't John the Baptist's father a priest? Yeah, that's right. That's so, right. you know, there may have been, well, may I have had some, some connections. Some, yeah, some access. However, there. they lived in Judea, and yeah. Christ and his family lived in Galilee, so. Um, yeah. Were there people back in those days who had memorized the Old Testament? Yes. And oh, yes. So there could have been someone in the community that oh, absolutely. memorized the whole Old Testament. Yeah, no question about that. And maybe Mary. I mean, that would be that would be very unusual, but it would be perfect as an answer to our questions. Um, well, anyway, the the interesting comment that Jesus made in Luke two forty nine was, you know, his parents were searching for him. Finally, they found him in the temple. And what was his response? Now, the King James says, "Didn't you know I must be about my father's business?" Well, that was unfortunately a translation when they didn't recognize. The, Hebrew, it, the, the Greek idioms. The Greek idioms said, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? 
So he understood. But his parents didn't understand. It goes on, verse 50, but they did not understand his answer. And the interesting thing is it goes on to say, so Jesus went back with them to Nazareth, where he was, obe where he was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. So here is the one who gave all the rules, gave all the laws, gave the entire Old Testament to the Moses and the other prophets and people who wrote in the Old Testament. And yet he goes back as a child and is obedient to his human parents. In so long as, what? It was not somehow in contradiction to the laws of God. Well, another example, we're, we're looking at examples of how Jesus related to the laws of the Old Testament particularly. He absolutely refused to bow down to Satan, and that w if he had bowed down to Satan, that would have been a violation of which rule? No other gods befall me. Yeah. Right there. First commandment. <clears throat> refused to do it. Well, obviously, Adventists like to point out that the one commandment that most people ignore or misunderstand is the Sabbath commandment. Yet we have clear, clear scriptures that Jesus observed the Sabbath on a regular basis, many of them. Luke 4.16 4, is probably the one that we, we quote most often. Look at that for a second, Luke 4.16. Then Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures and so forth. He went as usual. What does that imply? I think it's a little Habitual. vague. Habitual. <laughs> <laughs> <It's not laughs> it was his practice, his yes, custom. His custom, his practice. And to, to add to that, look at Philippians 2, starting with verse 5. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God. But he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal to, with God. Instead of, this, of this, instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of his servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. What is the path of obedience? Following the law. Following the laws. And that certainly would be God's laws. Um, another example of his following God's laws or comments about his following God's laws is Hebrews 4.15. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. What? Well, couldn't his, the obedience, couldn't that have been following his father's will? Sure. Yeah. So that... As that, opposed that, to strictly following the laws, right. you're saying? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, there was a purpose for his life and his purpose for, for being here and a certain job to do and it was the Father's will that this be done and so he was obedient to that will as well as yeah. mm -hmm. the law. <coughs> no, and <coughs> again, well, go ahead. Well, if the law is God's character, mm -hmm. how would somebody who has that character already have to follow the law? Because he is the law. Well, and, and that's true, but the point is, that's, that's a proof, really, of the fact that these are descriptive laws. They are descriptions of how God is, how he, how he is determined that things are supposed to be, the way they're supposed to work. This is not some arbitrary thing he just thought up one night, you know, to, to, but, to place but on it. prescriptive or descriptive, <coughs> whatever, it's still part of his character. It's supposed so to be then part how, of your character, too. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. I think it's when the Lord is in you that he brings his law to you. In harmony with. It's not, not inside me. It, well, um, it may be because God is in you that you perform the law. And that's one, that's one proof that he is with you. Okay. <laughs> Just, well... And there's look a couple more things that Jesus has said. I, I, I'm quite amazed at this occasion. Jesus faced 71 people, I assume they were all present, in the Sanhedrin. And he said, which of you can prove that I'm guilty of sin? And there was probably 95% of them that wished they could. He who comes, and then he says, if I tell the truth, then why do you not believe me? And s some of them must have realized how foolish they were being in their behavior. 
And of course, later, many of them became, not well, a number of them anyway, became Christians, followers of the way. But, um, I mean, here he stands right in front of the people who wished more than anything else that they could prove him guilty of sin. He had them cornered right there, yeah. in essence. They didn't even accuse him of cleaning out the temple, of upsetting their uh, money changer carts. But they knew perfectly well that those things were illegal. There was nothing in the commandments, so, nothing in the law, nothing in all the Old Testament that gave them permission to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. They knew that. And they knew that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, let's go to that new commandment now. John 13, 34 and 35. And I'll read it. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another. Is that new? Not at all. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Is that new? was for the Pharisees. Well, not just for the Pharisees. I don't mean it's square <laughs> what did the Old Testament commandment say? Maybe we better go back and look, huh? Yes, we need a refreshing. See if my... No, that won't take me there. Hold on just a second. The Old Testament... Remember the Old Testament reference was Leviticus 19.18. And what does it say? Do not take revenge on anyone or continue to hate him, but love your neighbor as you love yourself. I am the Lord. So what's the standard on which we're supposed to love? We love ourselves. As we love ourselves. Just, what is the new standard? As I have loved you, as Jesus loved. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So he took it out of the realm of you love like you love yourself where you're supposed to love like I love you. Exactly. That's a big difference. So now, so the, how is that really new? I mean, that would... You don't, you don't think Jesus' love for you is different than your love for yourself? Yes. Well, but wasn't, I mean, um, wouldn't, originally, weren't, wasn't that... Uh, the prescription for Adam and Eve. I mean, isn't isn't um, isn't that isn't that the, isn't that the innate law anyway? You're saying that it should always have been <clears throat> love as God loves us. All oh, right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, then that would be nice. But it just wasn't the facts. You know. You know, if you loved your others as you loved yourself, how can that? How can there be anything wrong with that? Because not everyone know how to love themselves. There's plenty of people who are killing okay, themselves because they don't <laughs> yes. love themselves. Yeah. Yes. So then are, are we saying that the law that was given in Leviticus wasn't really quite as uh, full and complete as it should have been? It was kind of a half law. I did think Jesus, that's exactly right. In the Old Testament, did Jesus talk to the people in the way they could understand? In the New Testament, he's, he's more um, giving, like he did all the other laws, fulfilling it in a in a in a bigger way. Not only love like you love yourself, but now love like I love. Well, in Acts of the Apostles, page 547, paragraph 1, Ellen White tries to spell this out in a little detail. At the time when these words were spoken, the disciples could not understand them. Mm -hmm. But after they had witnessed the sufferings of Christ, mm -hmm. after his crucifixion and resurrection mm -hmm. and ascension to heaven, and after the Holy Spirit had rested on them at Pentecost, they had a clearer conception of the love of God and of the nature of that love which they must have for one another. Mm -hmm. I'm a little confused. Okay. <laughs> How are we... Is this I've new never... or is this chronic? Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, I was never thinking seen the same Jesus. thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've never seen Jesus. Have you seen him? No. Well, then how are we going to know his love if we haven't seen him? Jesus answered that question right in John, in his prayer to the Father, just before the Garden of Gethsemane in John 17. He says, I want all of them, he speaks about himself, Father, he says, you know, I, I want this relationship to, between us to continue. Then he says, and these disciples who are with me, I want them to have a good relationship. And then he goes on to say, and all of those who choose to believe because of their witness, I want them to have the same kind of relationship that you have with me, Father. That's what he says. 
okay, they because of their witness. Because of their so witness. So where did the witness? Scripture. Where did the witness get there? You got idea. it right there in your in your. Yeah, but this is there. this is just text and paper. It mm. if it's just text and paper, you can throw it away. No, it is. It no, is it only isn't. text and paper. No, it isn't What's just it? text. It's what 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 it's gets it out more than text and paper is the spirit. Okay. And but, but that is really nothing to do with this te this paper and text. The spirit comes yeah. from God, but it, it, no. yeah, it and, and what you're making is it a valid point? There's a difference between our mind and our brain, but without the brain, there's no mind. It just as that, well, there's no spirit without those words. It's the same. It's the same idea. One is a function, and the other is the hardcore basis on which it on which it comes. It's the manifestation of the yeah. work of the spirit. First John four. Uh, verse 12, no man has ever seen God. Mm -hmm. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. But that's a process. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a... Sounds to me like switch. when God is in us, then we love one another. Well, but Jesus said, if, you've, see, yeah, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And when we, when we read this, we are seeing, yeah. we're seeing Jesus. Yeah. But, go ahead. Question? <clears throat> uh, when we say well, if, if there's no scripture, there's no spirit, what happened, there was, there was always the Holy Spirit, even before we had Bibles. Yeah. People, have, you felt God, I mean, God was always present. Yeah, yeah there's Abraham, yeah. Isaac, and Jacob. They, they, they didn't live just by God's appearances just those few times. They, they lived as they... What about Job? Yeah, there's Job. Well, they had, they had personal communication with God and the testimony of people that had lived hundreds of years, mm -hmm. their fathers, their grandfathers. Well, so what does Christ expect us to do? Look at 1 John 3, 16. It sound, we know that Christ came, lived and died. He answered the questions in the great controversy by his life and his death. So in what way are we supposed to follow that example? And here's 1 John 3, 16, not John 3, 16, but 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Christ gave his life for us. We too then ought to give our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now, have any of you been to a church service where one of the church members agreed to give their lives for the rest of the church? I think what do you people, mean by that? I think when people that's study and they spend their lives uh, studying and sharing, uh, that's, that's really they're devoted their life there. It's not... Their life is not self self centered uh, exercise. They're, they're, that's it's a okay. commitment. So what you're saying is that what we are really sacrificing, what dies, is the old man of sin that go. Paul talks about in Romans seven. I like that. Yeah. yeah. So we what we we're not giving we're not physically dying. We're dying to self. Yeah. yeah. When we some, sorry, go ahead. I think some of the early Christian ministries that went to certain countries, they in effect were putting their life on sure. the line. Oh yeah. yeah. And they weren't all Adventists I'm talking about. The likes of William Carey and some yeah. of those other early English mm -hmm. ones and people that went to New Guinea and died of black water fever and malaria. I mean, mm -hmm. they knew what they were getting into. Well, I think all of us would recognize that Paul is the one biblical writer who, uh, or author who spoke the most about law and how it impacts us and so forth. Um, so in light of that, how do you understand? Hold on just a second while my Bible decides to go to funny places here. <laughs> how do you understand 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23? Let me see if I can get this to move up so we can see it better. I'll do it like this. I am a free man. This is Paul's words. I am a free man, nobody's slave. But I make myself everybody's slave in order to win as many people as possible. While working with the Jews, I live like a Jew in order to win them. And even though I myself am not subject to the law of Moses, now remember, this is somebody who used to be a Pharisee of the Pharisees, okay? I live as though I were when, I were when walk, working with those who are in order to win them. In the same way, when working with Gentiles, I live like a Gentile. 
outside the Jewish law in order to win Gentiles. This does not mean that I don't obey God's law. I'm really under Christ's law. And I guess that's where our title for this lesson came from. Among the weak in faith, I become weak like one of them in order to win them. So I become all things to all people. And a lot of people want to stop right there. I want to be all things to all people. No, what's the purpose of becoming all things to all people? That I may save some of them by whatever means are possible. So if you're becoming all things to all people is for the purpose of saving others, that's fine. Okay? But... Being all things to all people, I think basically he just meant that he adapted his teaching to feed mm -hmm. people's cultures and what have you, but he wasn't sinning per se, he wasn't... Okay, so let's ask a specific question here. Did that mean that now that he's a Gentile to the Gentiles, this guy who used to be a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he's now a Gentile with the Gentiles, was he disobeying or breaking any of the Ten Commandments? And what is, That's the question we're trying. I think what he's, what he's, what he's referring to here is <clears throat> some of these rules and regulations and patterns were cultural. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, and uh, the Gentiles had certain cultural things, and the Jews had certain cultural things, and the Greeks had certain cultural things. And so when he was in these cultures, he did not necessarily insist that everybody around him uh, comply with his with his Jewish cultural patterns. That that would be my interpretation. I, okay. I, I don't know if that's correct or not. But in other words, there are, there are some cultural differences, right. maybe even cultural barriers, mm -hmm. hindrances to understand. So Paul said he tried to get as close to the Gentiles as he could. Have you ever asked yourself how easy was that for Paul? Has to mean tough. <laughs> now, to, in our days, would that mean, as an Adventist, if we're trying to witness to someone who owned a dairy or a chicken farm, and we were invited to their home, that we would fit in with them and eat the chicken and eat the cow, the beef, or eat the pork, in order to be able to talk to them on a level that instead of saying, no, we don't do this, and throwing up a wall? How would that, uh, that... That's a tough question, and I think everyone probably has to pretty much answer it for themselves. You have to mm -hmm. be mindful of your approach to yeah. everybody. And I think Paul was one of the f earlier ones that we know had experienced both sides of the salvation coin. Yeah. He'd gone from being an absolute radical to something for him totally different. What about, uh, well, I was, the first question I was going to say, well, how did that relate to the Passover? Did he celebrate, uh, a, did he let that interfere with the Passover? But after Jesus came along, the Passover wasn't necessarily uh, that important anymore. Yeah. But what about the Sabbath? Were there, I don't know, what, how did the Greeks approach uh, Sabbath? Was that some kind of a big conflict? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. And I would, I would say that the biggest conflict, we're going to maybe talk about this a little bit later, the biggest challenge would be talking about Jesus as the Savior of the world, and what do they know about him? He was a traitor to the Roman government who died on a cross. I mean, you know, the, 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 I mean, I had I have a friend who said, you know, all everybody these days wears little crosses around their neck and put them all over the place. He says, I'm thinking of making a T-shirt that celebrates Christ and has an electric chair on it. Mm. I mean, that's about the equivalent it was in those yeah. days, yeah. you know. It was the worst possible sentence you could give to somebody was putting him on a cross. And you, and you come up and say, guess what, I've got great news for you. Someone who died on a cross is here to save you. And they say, what? Yeah. You know, that must have been some kind of a cultural barrier. But they concentrated on him rising the third day. Yes, sure. Well, Paul has an interesting set of passages, I should perhaps call it. In Romans 1, you remember he focuses on the problems of the formerly pagan Christians. He says, when you were like that, you were really in bad shape. And then in chapter 2, what does he say? And you formerly Jewish, now Christians, were worse. And why were they worse? What was wrong with the formerly Jewish Christians? 
They were still Jewish and well, cult uh, culturally. They were expecting the new people in church to become Jews as well as Christians? In other words, if you're not doing all the things I'm doing, you are second class or third class or fourth class down there, right? Mm -hmm. They were judging their Christian brothers and sisters very unfair, unfairly. And Paul just tore into them. I mean, think how many times he had done that in the past. You know, and he says, we're not, we're not, we're not going to tolerate any Pharisees around here. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's those people that did worse were the ones that thought they were better. Well, say that again? <laughs> people, <laughs> you just said in other words. <laughs> the, yeah. the people who thought, who were the worst, uh -huh. thought they were better. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. it's almost like confession. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you confess... What it does tell you? It tells you who you are, and uh, they would not do that kind of thing. So now let's 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 try a modern equivalent. Those of us who let's say grew up as Christian as Adventists all our lives, how many serious friends do we have who are non-Adventists? Well, lot. when you live in a place like Loma Linda, you hardly know anybody that's not Adventist. Well, that's true because studies, that's where I got mine. And my friends nine, was away from here. Ninety percent of my friends are non-Adventists. Very good. Yeah. Um, and and w the reason I say very good is because Adventists, if you if you study them, when a person becomes an Adventist as an adult, in the first seven years, they still have a fair number of friends out there in the community, and slowly. Typically what happens, slowly they lose their friends who are non-Adventists, and pretty soon the only friends they have, the only people they associate with, are Adventists. I have and how are we going to spread the gospel to the world if the only friends we talk to or associate with are already Adventists? I had a friend who is of another church, and he said, Joanne, the thing that concerns me about your religion is its exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not quite sure what he meant by its exclusivity because I don't feel exclusive. So I'm not living in Loma Linda, but even mm -hmm. if I was living in Loma Linda, and I, I think when I see him next, I'll ask him what he means mm -hmm. by exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Would you know what he means by ex? I'm sure he, he, he perceives Adventists as being in a little ghetto of our own here and nobody else can get in and nobody else... And they don't, Adventists don't go out and nobody else is able to get in. There's one word covers it and it's a little severe. It's the word incestuous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, but, I mean, <clears throat> the minute you embrace the Sabbath and they don't, <clears throat> you are drawn away from their, their, um, you know, their, their yeah, they culture on that particular you know, day. Like you can go out and hand them some literature, I suppose, but, you know, there is a, the church is a shelter. Well, there are six other days. And you're supposed well, to you're supposed to <laughs> leave behind your evil associates and <laughs> they're not evil. <laughs> Some of these people are better Christians than me, so they're not well, evil. No. And, and, and we, we can't get too far away from our lesson. Uh -huh. Paul goes on and says some very interesting things. In Romans one twenty and also in chapter two, verses twelve to sixteen, he says, you know, truthfully even those people who have never been exposed to God's rules, have never heard the name of Jesus, know nothing about the Bible, there's really enough information in nature, if they pay attention, for them to be saved. So maybe we don't need to send missionaries out anymore or do any evangelism. We just quietly wait for the good Lord to come. That's no. not what the good Lord said. I, 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 believe, I believe that passage, but boy, sometimes it's sure hard to... It takes some real intuitive uh, understanding when you, I mean, in nature, everything eats everything else. Have it, you is, <coughs> it is possible to see God in nature and without having contact with the scripture, but it's so much easier with the scripture. Mm -hmm. You need to help make the connection. So much more straightforward. There, there are literally billions of people in our world, even though this is the 21st century, who have never heard the name of Jesus ever in their never. lives. What? I say, and might never. And might never. Too. Particularly, I would say, in communist China, probably the largest single group of them. 
What are we supposed to do for? Where you know, what it, is our responsibility to those people? Where does it say um, when a person gets to heaven, Jesus, what are those scars in your hand? Mm -hmm. Did that come from Ellen White? She talks about it. I don't know that that was, she was, that was original with her. Well, this review to people in China who have never heard the name of Jesus and so forth. Does that mean, I mean, what, what we're implying there is unless, we, unless, unless they hear the name of Jesus, <clears throat> and for us, as far as we're concerned, they don't know about the Sabbath and, mm -hmm. and the cosmic conflict and all that, those people that don't have a chance at, uh, at, um, at meeting Jesus in heaven. And I'm not quite sure I'm going to subscribe to that just yet. Yes. Maybe by the end of the broadcast I will, but I'm not <laughs> sure I'm ready to do it just yet. Well, you might have to wait because that's one of the major <coughs> topics of our discussion for next week. Oh. Okay. So you might have to stick by. Um, so, how does the grace of Christ empower you to live a new life like Jesus? Now, there's quite a few places that sort of imply that that's what we're supposed to do. So, how does that actually work? Monkey see, monkey do. You, um, which is something that I was always told as mm -hmm. I was growing up. But as you read about Jesus and you see how he handled people, it gives you better ideas how to handle people. Mm -hmm. So you say by beholding <laughs> we become changed. Yeah. Okay. I sure well, wish. My I family was. didn't say that. So. You're, you're talking <laughs> about you're talking about other people. I think the question is how does it how does it how does it change you? How does well, it you give you power to you you have this problem with tobacco and you can't get rid of it, uh, or you have a bad you have a bad temper. How how do you, am I going down the right track here, mm -hmm. Ken? Yeah. How, how does this grace, Change. where is the power to do this? Mm -hmm. Now, there are people, and you all know about them, who say, I gave my life to Jesus, once saved, always saved, now I can go back and live my life more or less the way I was living it before, and it's all we're taking care of. Thank the Lord. You know, I've heard of people like that, but I've never seen one. Oh, really? There, no. no. There. That's because you're in too much of a ghetto. Yeah, you're in Loma Linda. Right. No, I don't know. I went to MSU. I know a lot of people. Uh -huh. And I've never seen anybody that said that. Uh, so I guess there is. Everybody's telling me that there is. But, uh, there are, there are. I, okay. I have a friend, I won't say where, who did some contract work for me uh, in my house and lives in the general area, and he is definitely like that. Now, he also knows quite a lot about the Bible. He's not an educated man in the sense we're used to. He's a good tradesman. But he basically believes that. But he, he even though he believes it, he thinks he can do anything, go out and drink and no, go out and carouse around. And no, that. I've never gotten into that. Well, point. that's the point I'm making there. And that's, that's what I'm kind of hearing people saying that, Okay, I'm saved. Now I can just go out and drink and carouse around, yes. go with women the, the, all over the, the place. The classic example was from a number of years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago now. Uh, I guess I can mention him his name. He's a public figure. Jimmy Swaggart yeah. was a huge public evangelist and TV appearances and I think his own network and all that kind of stuff. And he was discovered down in Palm Springs with a prostitute. Right. Yeah. And he came out and what did he say? Did it under the blood. I sinned under the blood. I'm so sorry, but I sinned under the blood. So it's fine. He's back on he the, still has a program. He's back on yeah. the air again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, he's back on the so air. So this, this business of, of power to available for me to make corrections in my life, that, that's... Uh, tell us more. <laughs> well, how, here, how powerful is that? How here's Ephesians two verse ten. I mean, that that seems to leave me without much of an excuse. I see. Ephesians two verse ten. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, now that must be the secret. He has created us for a life of good deeds, which He has already prepared for us to do. So, God's intention, and if we had time, we would read Titus 2, 11 to 14, that says more or less the same thing. Galatians 6, 1 to 5, something similar. Um, we're supposed to bear one another's burdens. We're supposed to help each other. We're, sp we're supposed to die to self so we can help each other. That's not, 
that's helping everybody else. That's not helping me get over my temper. Well, but that, that's exactly the way you get over your temper, by helping somebody else. If you're busy helping some, somebody else, it, it's not nearly as easy to let you fly off the handle. Oh, I don't know. They sure get irritating sometimes, <laughs> and they don't do what I tell them to do. But now, are you helping them, or are you telling them what to do? Well, I get irritated when they don't follow my example. How's that? <laughs> Dennis, <laughs> go ahead. You may remember uh, Norm uh, mm -hmm. reading from Faith I Live By, page 150. Mm -hmm. uh, you could look that up if you uh, uh, wanted to. It's a very powerful statement about keeping Jesus in front of us mm -hmm. all the time. Like, like an after image of looking at the sun. You have mm. sunspots in front of your eyes, and everywhere you look, you see the sun. Mm. And that is the, the, the place we want to get to, mm -hmm. so that we see Jesus all the time. Yeah. And if we see Jesus in everything that we encounter, we have a hard time losing our temper. We have a hard time saying things we shouldn't. We're, well, you we know, don't have too many more minutes left. So well, Ken, <laughs> um, well, like you're an inspiration. I don't think the audience knows this, but like you ran the LA Marathon, Los Angeles Marathon, just two days ago. Yeah. You have a job helping uh, in a clinic for the poor. Yes. You teach Bible study <coughs> three, four times a week. So That's my hobby. Uh, where do you get your inspiration to? The same way I think everybody should. It's when I run, I listen to the Bible. I listen to the writings of Ellen White. I listen to inspirational talks from other people. I have my little MP3 player. Um, so that's running what I like gives to you do. time to do the connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was running. I listened to what four hours of inspirational stuff while I was running marathon. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, many examples could be given of Christ's incredible kindness and graciousness in dealing with our weaknesses. Look at these incredible words. I, I find these words just unbelievable about Christ. This is Desire of Ages 353, first paragraph. Christ himself did not suppress one word of truth, but he spoke it always in love. He exercised the greatest tact and thoughtful, kind attention in his intercourse with the people. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, Jay, never, no time to fly off the handle, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censor human weakness. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. Now, how do you do that? I mean, that's an incredible accomplishment. You're, you're uttering a scathing rebuke, and there's tears in your voice. How do you do that? Wouldn't you love to have a YouTube video wow. of Jesus, how he talked, and... I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I think, spend the first thousand years in heaven just standing there watching the video of the Christ life with my mouth hanging open. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just, I can't... I can't imagine. There's going to be so many questions I have and so many things I'm going to want to see. Mm. That, that description, there's a total lack of self-centeredness, is yeah. it not? I mean, there's, it's a... Uh... Well, and we've said this before, that, you know, if you were to describe Satan's kingdom in one word, it's selfish. Mm -hmm. If you describe God's kingdom in one word, other it's centered. love. Yeah, which is other-centered. Other-centered, yeah. So. Well, lots of people, they, they want to give it to you with both barrels <laughs> you know oh, and, yeah, yeah. and there's a point where he had to do that and the, he didn't like it and that's what I think the tears were in his his yeah. voice because he, there's not very much possibility that they're going to take it after that point in, in the last few minutes we have we need to recognize that the law is not just about how we live here and now eventually that law is somehow going to be the standard on which God judges now, how's that going to work out? Uh, let me just mention a couple of verses that maybe get that uh, discussion started. Remember Revelation 22, verse 11? Whoever is evil must go on doing evil. Whoever is filthy must go on being filthy. Whoever is good must go on doing good. And whoever is holy must go on being holy. 
And then, of course, the famous verse for Adventists, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples on the earth, of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation, he said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise his greatness, for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven and earth, sea, and the springs of water. So now, is the law going to sort of turn on us at the end and condemn us? Yeah? As Adventists, we believe that we will be in heaven for a while and will repopulate a new earth and that we will live together in harmony for eternity. What rules will we live by then? Yeah. I suspect that these are the rules by which we must live by to be able to live in harmony with each other for a very long period of time. Okay, L let me see if you, in a minute or so we have left, there are many Christians who feel very relieved by the idea that Jesus is our judge instead of the Father. They draw this conclusion from reading John 5, 22 and, 20 and 30, which more or less suggests that. But elsewhere in the same gospel, John made it very clear how the judgment works. In John 3, 17 through 21 and 12, 47 to 48, it clearly states that we will be judged by the truth, by the light. So what do you think, make of this particular statement from our Bible study guide? The fact that Christ has been assigned the responsibility of judgment demonstrates the mercy of God because God has become one with the human race. He is in a position to judge impartially. Is that supposed to suggest that the Father would not be capable of judging impartially? Is there something faulty with the Father's knowledge of humanity? The idea is so commonly expressed in various forms that the Father is the harsh, severe judge and that Jesus must plead with him to convince him to forgive us is absolutely pagan. Excuse me for being very blunt. There is no separation of any kind between the members of the deity. The Father thinks and feels about us exactly the way the Son does. And if you want to read about that, that I may know him, page 338, which says specifically, if the Father had come in place of the Son, the message we have would not have been one tiny little bit different. Imagine what it will be like to live with two like that forever. See you next week.